All right, welcome everybody. Um, this is the Drupal.org panel and the Q&A session. So we're gonna be talking about, it's kind of an expansion on uh, the conversation that happened during the public board meeting yesterday. We'll go over some of the same uh, updates and provide a little bit more technical detail on some of those topics. We'll also talk about some of the things that didn't make it into that presentation time um, that we've been doing uh, in the past six months or so. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, Roadmap for the Future and just open up questions to uh, all of you and have some conversations. Um, we hope that this will be more of a conversational session than just a, a pure presentation. So, uh, and with that said, I'd like to encourage you to feel free to um, raise your hands to ask questions or, or come up to stand at the mic, even if you have questions kind of in the middle of the presentation, although we'll also spend time at the end. Um, so, as we get started, I'd just like to do a few introductions of the folks that you see up here on the panel. Um, so I'm uh, Tim Lennon Hestinet on Drupal.org. I'm the Director of Engineering for the Drupal Association. Um, I have been on Drupal.org for something like 11 years now, so um, been around and about. Um, let's see, Neil, why don't you go ahead? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is true, all right. Introduce us. I will introduce the team, all right. Um, so yeah, Neil Dome is the sort of uh, architect of Drupal.org um, and helps uh, maintain uh, all the features and the issue queues and everything that we uh, use every day. Um, Ryan Aslett, Mixologic on Drupal.org. Um, all things Q&A, Drupal CI, Composer. Um, Brendan Blaine is a Drupal developer and uh, uh, IT um, support for the Drupal Association team. Um, and has been uh, doing work recently on some of the documentation features and on um, Drupal jobs and various things that you've seen here and there. And then we also have um, Michael Hess joining us as a uh, infrastructure volunteer, um, also a member of the security working group uh, to talk about a few things that uh, he's been helping us out with. Um, so sort of our unofficial fifth man. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I also want to say thank you in particular to our technology supporters. Um, the technology supporters are a particular category of supporting partner with, uh, in our supporting partner program uh, that help us specifically with um, either uh, integrations that we use on Drupal.org or simply to help fund uh, the technology team here. And, oops. So um, I'm structuring the conversation here around two areas of work that we do. Um, You'll recognize this image from the presentation in DrupalCon Dublin talking about uh, features around the uh, adoption journey that is supported by Drupal.org and features around the contribution journey. Um, the con concept behind these is um, uh, providing the tools for evaluators to start their Drupal journey, whether they're developer evaluators or end user evaluators of Drupal.org, um, and then um, leveling people up into a place where they can contribute back to the project whether those contributions are code, uh, design, uh, financial support, um, whatever that, that type of contribution may be. Um, so I'll start with some of the adoption journey topics and as we go on, we'll get into sort of more technical and more technical topics as we go. Um, and as I said before, please feel free to interrupt me at any time for uh, Q and A. Um, so we recently launched, as I mentioned in the board meeting, uh, new industry pages on drupal.org. Uh, the pilot launch was, uh, higher education page, a media and publishing page, and a government page to promote uh, to technical evaluators of Drupal uh, in these fields, um, the ways that Drupal can be used to build a solution. Um, the kind of story and user journey of these pages um, focuses on um, uh, the particular vertical, in this case, the higher education example, um, giving the kind of basic pitch for Drupal, but then also highlighting specific features about uh, Drupal that are relevant to the market and uh, statistics uh, about kind of adoption in that market for Drupal. Um, we talk about how Drupal is just part of a combination of technologies that's used um, to find a solution in a particular industry. Um, oops. We feature uh, case studies uh, about uh, from Drupal.org about each of these uh, uh, vertical areas and these are um, geo-targeted to uh, the Americas, uh, EMEA, and APAC regions. Um, we promote events like the Higher Education Summit that happened here at Baltimore and the ones that are coming up um, in the next cons. 
and um, for the selected partners whose case studies are featured, we are experimenting for the first time with um, uh, sort of matchmaking uh, people who have interest in these areas with service providers. Um, and so we've selected partners who are uh, from kind of a list of criteria based on their contributions uh, of code and contributions to the association and participation um, and presence uh, on Drupal.org. Uh, so that's new for us and an interesting experiment in funding the work uh, that goes into the tooling and the rest of Drupal.org. Um, and that extends as well to case studies and it's something that might become a feature more widely for uh, other organizations um, as we kind of experiment with it further and see how that goes. Uh, so we may see improvements to organization profiles at large on a similar way. Um, so talking briefly about the technical implementation of these pages, um, if you're all into Drupal, you're familiar with most of these concepts, but um, for Drupal.org, some of this is pretty new because we've been focused on very uh, developer-oriented content before. So this is some of the first evaluator content that we've provided. So these are all built with panelized pages. We take the uh, 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 GOIP information in from our CDN, uh, stash that in a header and use pane visibility rules to personalize the content based on the region that our visitors are coming from. Um, yeah, and a special thanks to uh, Diane that was sitting in the back there for helping us out with the uh, design of these pages and the implementation. We appreciate all the help there. Um, so um, and the next set of updates for uh, the kind of adoption journey side of things, uh, since we um, uh, last gave an update in Dublin, uh, is a few additional changes to documentation, primarily targeted at uh, contrib maintainers and more tools for them to use uh, the new and more robust uh, documentation systems available on Drupal.org. Um, so the most basic one is you can now attach documentation guides directly to your projects um, and have them available kind of in line in place um, right in the project sidebar. Uh, you can see it highlighted there. Um, we also have, uh, it was about a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago, we finally enabled the migration of contrib documentation out of the old book pages into this new system. So uh, any contrib maintainer can start doing that and doing that migration. And that's a pretty good activity for a Friday sprint if you're looking for something else to do in your documentation maintainer. Um, and we want to give a shout out to uh, TDM, who is not in the room at the moment, but who kind of spearheaded the whole documentation initiative. Um, uh, another improvement that you may not have seen yet, but it's something that's helpful if you maintain a lot of documentation, is there's now uh, documentation callouts, um, we're calling them. Um, these are warning notes or version specific notes that you can include in documentation pages. So you can do things like say, hey, don't do this in production <laughs> and make it stand out from uh, the rest of your documentation pages. And you can provide in context uh, highlights of um, like minor version specific changes within a larger documentation page. Um, and these are styles that we've reused throughout Drupal.org for other places. So if you've looked at the community discussions page, the, well, the community homepage now provides a link to that information highlighted using that second style. So we're using it to draw attention and reuse that pattern in a few ways. Um, also, the uh, community initiative to drive forward the um, Drupal 8 user guide was something that was happening um, sort of between Dublin and now. Um, and I want to give a particular thanks to the documentation working group and to Jay Hodgden for all the work putting that together. Um, if you're not familiar with it, the, the uh, D8 user guide is a um, curated to kind of a, a higher editorial standard than just broadly edited documentation that's organized uh, by the documentation working group with kind of more tight editorial control. And the goal is to have a kind of um, completely understood um, uh, journey for learning to use Drupal, Drupal 8 in particular, um, more up to the standard of an industry publication than um, kind of ad hoc pieces of, of um, documentation. And that was um, implemented with uh, Drum and Jay Hodgson's help uh, using a um, bridge module. It's, uh, the, the actual documentation was created in ASCII-Doc, but we're bridging it to the documentation guides and documentation pages um, on Drupal.org. Um, so what's, what else is coming up with relating to the adoption journey side of um, uh, the work that we do? 
Um, there's going to be some more industry pages coming up. Uh, healthcare is probably going to be the next launch, but we're looking to others. We want to promote those things that we've seen in um, in our sort of search logs and things are the, the things that evaluators, particularly anonymous users, go in and look for and land on, which modules they're looking at, um, which parts of the marketplace. Um, and we want to make sure to provide content for them that hasn't existed in the past. Um, we're going to start creating improvements to project discovery. And some of these, which were going to be what's coming, have actually already been done. Uh, so for example, you've seen that you can now star favorite projects. Um, once we've built up enough of a volume of of things there, we're gonna be adjusting the search ranking to take those into account. Um, and that's gonna be one way of um, kind of filtering out the most used and most popular modules and helping people make decisions. We've also finally started uh, weighting search um, of, uh, based on module usage. So um, an example people have liked to trot out in the past is searching for views didn't always bring up views as the first result. Um, and that's something that's uh, finally fixed. And again, you'll see now the more widely used modules um, uh, coming right up at the top of searches. And then we're gonna do uh, a, lot of more, a lot more work on project pages having to do with project discovery around providing code quality signals, um, doing some static analysis of the code base and providing um, static analysis results um, with the goal of giving people who are evaluating what modules to use the information they need to understand what's well-maintained, uh, what meets coding standards, what's part of the uh, opted into the security process, um, all of those things, so they can make good decisions about how to build their sites. Um, and then the last thing that we're thinking about is there's a discussion in the issue queues uh, going on about um, how, we, how we can avoid leaving behind the sort of site builder audience um, with the uh, latest state of um, Drupal 8 being heavily composer dependent, heavily command line focused, and whether we could build perhaps uh, a, a dedicated application for um, doing dependency management, pulling everything in, and giving someone something they can use, even if they don't have command line access on their host. Um, Brian, would you like to talk about that one a little bit more? Just um, yeah, um, I'll take the back. Basically, the idea is that we've uh, kind of Drupal 8 cycle, we've seen the bar raise a little bit from um, people being able to just download a tarball and upload it to a site with FTP or you know, using, using kind of a Windows Explorer interface and that was really easy, but now more and more modules are starting to depend on things like Composer to be able to pull in all their dependencies, which is more of a command line interface build tool, which if you're not comfortable with the command line or you're not used to that sort of a build environment, um, it can be really difficult for uh, kind of a certain class of users where it's like, we, you know, wherever we're drawing the line of Drupal ambition, we could pull it down just a little bit so that we have kind of a greater swath of people who can use Drupal. And so the idea is to have a, a build tool that would allow people to create or manage the, uh, a Drupal site um, with all of the complexity abstracted away from them so they don't have to run Composer, don't have to run um, of the command line. And so that sort of tool, you know, the, trying to wrangle a lot of people in the community to figure out like how, you know, let's start with the UX of this tool and start with the, the design of it and start with how, what's the ideal workflow for somebody in that situation or, and, you know, kind of define who we're targeting with that. So, but yeah, that's. So um, before I talk a, a little bit more about sort of contribution tools and the contribution journey side of our work, um, any other questions about kind of uh, work around adoption, um, around features provided for evaluators and, and things of that nature? All right, I will keep moving along. Okay, so let's talk about some of the work we've done around the contribution journey. Um, and there's some big things here. Um, there's some controversial topics. There's a lot of things that I think we can um, uh, kind of dig into a little bit here. So. Um, first one I'll start with, um, because it's a little bit more straightforward, um, again, expanding on the conversation that we had in uh, the board meeting is about uh, contribution credits and the marketplace ranking um, and how that system is built and how that works. Um, so we use these factors um, to rank organization contributions in the marketplace. Issue credits weighted by the widely used modules the presence of Drupal 8 case studies associated to the organization, whether they're supporting partners, whether they're organization members, and whether they've been listed as supporters of the project by maintainers of those projects. 
Um, and so this is a, a little bit of a broader base, a little bit of a more sophisticated way to recognize the different kinds of contributions made at an organizational level. Um, at the same time as we're looking at contributions on an individual level. Um, Neil, is there anything you'd like to say about kind of how we built that? Um, <laughs> yeah, um, it, yeah, a lot, more or less allows us to, to um, put together kind of a background algorithm that assigns weights to these different kinds of user activities and puts time limits around some of them and gives us an internal score that we use in these, these rankings. Yeah. Yeah. From the start, it has been. Uh, yeah, the Drupal org module is uh, what we, that's where we tell all our sites and visible stuff. There'll be dragons, but. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the thing we don't do open source out of that is the fed actual factors, like in, in what's worth 50%, what's worth 10%. Uh, but the, yeah, we going and collecting what's the new credit. Yeah, uh, certainly on the individual level, we have a lot of that stuff recorded that goes through user profiles, but uh, some of it we do, some of it we don't. Documentation edits and things that we do, but, um, but, but tying those kinds of things into like organization, um, uh, something we'd have to think about because right now when we do those activities, we don't have a way to attribute them. So that's something we need to yeah. build in. We don't store whether you're doing the translation on this key time or your own time right now. So yeah. that's where yeah. all these start. Uh, uh, of course, it's just the use of this algorithm to add to the record. Yeah, and that's another thing. We do want to focus on the individual contributor um, uh, recognition a, a little bit too. And we've been having a few good conversations here at, uh, at the con about ways to do that. Um, in some ways, it's a trickier problem, right? Because we don't just put a rank of users anywhere, but we have to find other ways to um, recognize those contributions. Um, but, um, you know, on the individual level, one that was just brought up, uh, I had a conversation maybe an hour ago, was that um, we do a lot of good work with the uh, issue credit stuff, but for maintainers themselves, for people who are making direct commits to their projects, there actually currently isn't a way to just do that commit if it's not related to an issue. and, and um, credit that sort of thing. So that might be something that we'll fix up soon too. Um, but um, we'd like to, again, the, the whole point of this is trying to be reaching out beyond code, both on the organizational level and the individual level. So, um, and among other things, it, it lets us measure who participates in building Drupal and who participates in these other areas, um, both on an individual and organizational level, in ways that we haven't been able to before. So that data has been uh, really helpful as, yeah. Have you ever looked at, um, you could, would it be possible to modify a script fairly easy to, to like grab and search it and just delete it and make a step for like the size of the, the git changes? Um, that's, uh, we probably could do that. Um, that's tricky, uh, actually. Yeah, probably just want to keep going. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, let, let, let me talk about a little bit about sort of, so there's all sorts of concerns about um, contribution in terms of what the scope of a valuable contribution is and that notion of kind of a drive-by reroll um, <laughs> that people have been uh, uh, talking about um, recently. So um, there's a lot to say about that, right? Because we don't want to be, um, we don't want people to be farming contribution reputation based on low quality contribution. But at the same time, we want to recognize that um, for some people, even at a organizational level, um, it may be their first introduction to contribution at all. And it may be an opportunity to educate them on better ways to contribute, on new ways to contribute. Um, so we don't want to assume malice when we're responding to that um, kind of situation. I had a great conversation with uh, XJM about how Core has started to um, uh, kind of 
evaluate this issue um, and how they're they're building some uh, internal policies about how those maintainers uh, evaluate different kinds of contributions and when they choose to reach out to someone. And she said they have they've had some success saying, "Hey, you know, these rerolls, sure they're kind of nice, but could you, um, you know, if you're gonna or if you're gonna make a specific kind of coding standards change." For us, it's, it's valuable once you've done that throughout the whole subsystem, not one for each individual change, you know, that kind of thing. Little things to encourage people to, to make them genuinely useful. Because small contributions are contributions too, but, um, but there's ways that we can use this as an on-ramp to greater contribution, um, as long as we don't consider it, as long as we don't come at it from an antagonistic perspective from the start. Um, at the same time, we do need to protect the integrity of the process. So. Um, so yeah, this is more or less what I was just saying. We just want to have some caution and some empathy. There are some some tooling things that we might be able to do to to um, to help a little bit with um, managing, uh, you know, who's who's in the credit matrix and different kinds of things like that. There's some ideas being thrown around. Um, there's not a silver bullet there necessarily because you know the maintainer has the human eyes. On, on the contribution. There's some things that we can detect automatically and some things we can't. One of the things that will help from my technical point of view is when we have, um, uh, you know, an automatically generated coding standards fix patch already being posted by the CI system. So that, that whole category of kind of drive-by contribution is just no longer exists because it's being done by the, by the bots. So. Um, yeah, it is not a whole lot. Yeah, something so significant. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so part of it, it was when it comes to trying to like automatically evaluate the quality of a code contribution, if we could do that really well in an automated way, I think the bots would be writing the code themselves. So um, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tricky, but there, there is more we can do. Um, and actually, if you have ideas on ways to do that, we'd love to hear them, whether that's through tools in the CI system or other, other things that we can do. Um, also, I want to give Joe a quick shout out because you came in after we talked about some of the doc stuff. So um, just wanted to say thank you for the, um, between the user guide and some of the uh, organization around, um, you know, putting together the guides and pages in the new system. So. Um, <laughs> Um, so another big topic, and one that is certainly somewhat controversial, is this change that recently happened to project applications, and essentially the uh, elimination of a project application gate on the creation of full projects with full releases um, in favor of an uh, opt-in process to security coverage, um, and some a variety of new signals being provided on project pages to help that we're still working on um, to help. Uh, evaluators know what kinds of projects to use. So let me step through kind of the process here and what the decision making was. And you've probably seen some announcements about this before, but I'd be happy to answer some more questions. Um, so this was a sort of a four phase project um, as we were tackling the question of how to, um, how to uh, drop that project application gate um, from contribution on Drupal.org. We wanted to start with preserving um, signals about security advisory coverage as strongly as we could. We wanted to transition that process to an opt-in process so that we could, uh, so that the security team can manage the workload um, a little bit better. If everything is instantaneously covered, that can be a flood, and that this allows them to have the opportunity to either use their own application process for coverage or potentially. I don't know if you, you or the team have talked about other other ways to um, evolve the opt-in. Going forward. Yeah, so do you want to describe that? So bit? eventually, the current opt in process, which is, as I think we all agree, somewhat fundamentally broken, will be replaced by a somewhat random question quiz where you will answer questions a little bit on Drupal.org policy and then a little bit on security questions themselves with a much higher focus on the security questions. Um, and so if you pass that, you'll be given the role. If you don't pass that, you'll just be taken. Yeah. 
around. So we'll, we'll talk about what that looks like and what it means to have that role, that ability to opt into security advisory coverage um, in a minute here. So let me, I'll run a, a little bit further through these, these phases. So these are the kind of security coverage signals that we're talking about. So um, you've seen these already by now because they're on Drupal.org projects kind of all over the place. Any project that's um, not opted in or doesn't have the stable release is going to have this uh, not covered message um, uh, up at the top of the page and one down by the download table, depending on where you're looking at things, a uh, warning about the lack of coverage and providing any informational links about the advisory policy. Um, there's also an in-progress core patch to provide some information for those who are, um, you know, in their actual Drupal installations about whether or not they're using modules that are, that do receive advisory coverage or that will have any security issues publicly disclosed. So we want to be informative. Um, and then in that issue, um, currently we're working with uh, members of the UX team in particular to figure out how to make that messaging kind of responsible so that it's um, loud enough and informative enough, but not frightening people away from, from Drupal. Um, so this is what it would look like on the project page when you do have coverage. Um, so you'll see there's the indication about what a shield icon means, stable releases covered by the advisory policy, and then in the download table, those releases which are covered have a corresponding icon. Um, and so, and this is, if you're a project maintainer, this is what the opt-in looks like, uh, assuming you have access um, to opt-in the project. Um, and it has the in-context information about applying to, to be given access to do that. Um, finally, we added one more feature. Um, we really want, um, so one of the consequences of this change is that we've decoupled the notion of a stable release from a security advisory covered release. Um, and that's a significant, significant change. And it's something that needs to be communicated and well understood because we want, we want people to, to understand these signals and we want them, we want to incentivize them to participate in the process. So another thing that we've done is we've added release warnings. So when you go to roll a release, if you don't have coverage, if you're trying to make a stable release, you'll get this uh, process that gives you just general information about best practices for when you roll a release um, and also kind of warns you, hey, do you think maybe you want to go ahead and opt into that process? Yes, please, Peter. Yeah, we would, we've been talking about uh, taking a look at the data on, um, uh, on whether we're seeing uh, like a flood of uh, dangerously insecure modules or whether we're, we want to, we want to, um, we want to gather, we want to know what's changed since we opened this up. Um, and we want to know um, what, um, you know, what the consequence has been of this change. Because our hope is what, it, what will happen is we'll have new contributors, people who weren't able to get through the old process will have a broadening of, of the user base. But that possibility exists that we'll see significant negative consequences. So I'd like to, um, we've talked about going ahead about six months after the change. I don't know, is that four months from now? At this point, it's already been two months. Oh my God, it doesn't feel like it. But um, yeah, is, is you know, um, we can query pretty easily to see how many projects have been made by the non-vetted users. Um, um, by people who haven't opted in and get some inf information about this. Um, so yeah, we'll take a look. Um, again, we're, we're hoping that the strength of those signals um, will kind of counterbalance. Um, and in fact, I mean, this is just speaking in, in my opinion, but, um, and from some anecdotal conversation, but I think that some of these, um, some of this messaging on project pages has made people much more aware of what the security advisory process is than they've ever been before. So to that extent, I think um, so far that seems successful. Um, okay, yeah, and so obviously once we had those signals in place, um, this random GIF demonstrates that yes, you can in fact go ahead and make a full project. Um, yeah, we still have some, you know, documented recommendations about, hey, maybe it's still good to use a sandbox project if you're not ready to start thinking about a release candidate and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's all available when we've started to see some of that activity. Um, yeah, and as Peter referred to, we want to we want to measure that. Um, we want to make sure it's having the effect that it's intended to have, um, which is broadening the contribution base 
like I'm not diluting the reputation for security and quality to an unacceptable degree. Um, and a million people to thank, as I did during the uh, board meeting. Um, there's tons of people involved. Um, not everybody involved in this, um, uh, you know, uh, is people who were just gung ho. Let's go ahead and do this. But these are all the people that we had to have some difficult conversations with to figure out how to implement this in what I think is a responsible way. What I think will prove out to be a, a good change. Um, so. Okay, and any more questions on, yeah. When you mentioned the tight end, the notion of the We've been thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been, we've been thinking about adding a number of different things. That's, that's one of kind of the obvious ones um, to, to affect the weight, right? It's something that has stable releases, that's opted in. Um, it, those are all factors that, that should generally suggest that's the one you should use over the one that doesn't have those things. So yeah, they're, they're clearly, clearly important elements. Um, any more questions about uh, project applications or um, security messaging? Um, about the gaming system. Oh, sure. Uh, as a new maintainer, I've seen lots of people go through and do mining of different things. Mm -hmm. um, speaking as a person who has a commit and core Fixing and selling of URL. <laughs> um, what I try to do when that happens is push the people who do that to make it a more uh, complete patch. So it's not just fix this one standard fix, it's well, let's see what our other standards issues are. Um, I saw one person commit a couple of three different patches for similar things in their clients. So again, Get them to combine it all into one. And like you said, don't take it as a don't approach it from the point of view of some gaming system, but try and just get them to um, make more of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I originally suggested we use the type of fix before, uh, Jennifer Hodgson suggested expanding the scope mm -hmm. to cover HTTP, HTTPS, and so on. So that's what I did. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, I think that's good advice in general. It's very similar to what I, the feedback that I heard from XGM earlier just here at the conference is that that's one way of addressing that problem is, is taking those small things and saying, well, what in the same category builds this up into something that we consider a significant enough contribution um, and ramping them up in that way. Um, yeah. Any more questions there? Okay. I'm going to go on and talk about Drupal CI or maybe make this guy talk about Drupal CI. <laughs> um, so in very general terms, uh, especially over the last four months or so, uh, testing for Drupal has significantly more sophisticated, significantly more robust in a few different ways. Um, there's a much more flexible testing matrix. Uh, this is something, I don't know, Ryan or Neil, if you want to talk about this, but um, we, um, well, we kind of label the environments that you can select to test your code based on what is kind of current for core um, and uh, uh, the variety of environments available. Um, we mark the defaults that core is tested against and um, we have scheduling options to uh, better let you set up regular testing on a one-off basis, on a daily basis, on a non-commit basis, or just for issues. Um, course weekly. Hmm? Course weekly. Hey, that's weekly. And weekly, yes. <laughs> we, have, we have weekly as well. So there's just a lot more flexibility in how you can manage the testing for your contrib uh, module at this point. And uh, local testing has gotten a little bit easier. Um, so there's a, a vagrant box provided in the CI test runner repo. So rather than having to figure out how to configure the whole thing, you can vagrant up and kind of go off to the races. Um, and coding standards testing is available. Is this something you want to talk about a little bit? Sure, we can talk about that. Um, <clears throat> so part of what's happened, <clears throat> excuse me, part of what's happened in the, uh, in the Drupal CI world is we've um, uh, kind of underwent a little bit of a re-architecture of the first proof of concept that we were using to get Drupal 8 out the door. And as a result of that, we were able to add in some more plugins to run all the different coding standards checks that we want to run in core and, and, and in contrib. And so, We've got ESLint, CSSLint, and um, HP Code Snipper. 
And these things are uh, available for module maintainers to use uh, by providing config files, or if they don't have a config file, it'll default to whatever core has provided. And um, it's just a really good way for us to be able to encourage people to maintain you know, Drupal coding standards and eventually get to the point where you can actually like fail patches if they don't match coding standards. So we're doing that now in core with ESLint because everything in, in core has, you know, all of their JavaScript looks good. And so they want to keep it that way. And so that this way they, um, the, uh, this way it also reduces human time to have to manage these, uh, these sorts of issues. So when someone submits a patch, you don't want to go back and be like, well, you're missing some spaces. And you know, it's like, it's just kind of a, nobody feels good about pointing out those kind of errors to people. And so it's just nice that there's a robot that does it and nobody has to, you know, waste time on that. So, but yeah, that's, that's one of the things. And then there's other, other plugins coming soon to be able to, cool. yeah, do more testing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, ICMPD, uh, one service that one project takes is Snow. Uh, it's another signal that you are evaluating, evaluating the Drupal module. Yeah, it's another part of this code quality kind of. And, and, and I'm pretty sure in Dries' keynote, he was talking about how as we move forward to modules, using deprecated APIs, this code sniffer tool will actually, I believe, can find those and let you know that, oh, you're using a deprecated yeah, API. Deprecated APIs, and uh, keep, uh, we're getting more of the uh, old uh, project management use scripts baked into this, so uh, catch, um, that uses deprecated APIs when uh, it's not doing issues. Yep. Trying to produce a lot of automation around that code quality stuff as much as it's possible. Um, so, and I want to say thanks here. Mile 23 is not here at the con, but um, he was really instrumental in getting uh, coding standards work uh, available in Drupal CI. So, many thanks. Um, let's talk about Composer. This is kind of going to be you as well, but um, yeah. Um, yeah, after a lot of. Um kind of sitting on it and watching it run in December, we decided, okay, this is good. It, it's working. We have the Composer facade now. And so developers are able to use Composer to include Composer packages in their modules and also use Composer to build Drupal sites, which is sort of a one of the off the island ideas that Drupal 8 started to adopt early on in its release cycle by incorporating Symfony packages. And, but this, this, this will allow us to do a lot of nice things like not have to rewrite code that somebody else on in the PHP community has already written. So, you know, because there's, there's a lot of problems that everybody's already solved and it would be nice to just be able to leverage that. And so um, that, that exists now and it works. And um, there's been a lot of sessions, a lot of trainings online I've seen about you know, how to build sites with Composer now and how to use that as part of your build and deployment workflow. Um, as we mentioned earlier, this does kind of raise the bar for some folks and say, well, you have to use command line or you have to have enough memory to run Composer because it's long and it's slow. And so it also, you know, you solve some problems and new ones crop up. So it's you know, problem whack-a-mole as engineering always is. Um, and then uh, just this week, we uh, leveraged a, a tool from Fabian Potenser of uh, Symphony called uh, Subtree Split. Uh, the subtree split sh program that he wrote in Go to take the Drupal core repository, look for Composer JSONs within that repository, which underneath Drupal source component, you have all of these pieces of Drupal that were designed from the beginning to be able to be used in any other PHP project. So there's one called like core UUID. So if you're a Laravel developer, you could use this core UUID piece and have a chunk of Drupal in, in your site. And so we've built these subtree splits. They got pushed over to GitHub and then packages is consuming them. So now anybody in the greater PHP community can use parts of core. And one of the first consumers of that is gonna be Drupal CI because we had copied and pasted the whole plugin and annotation architecture out of Drupal 8. And now we can get rid of all that code and just compose a require the plugin annotation architecture so that we can use that piece in Drupal CI. And there's a note there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's still, um, there's still some review that you're sort of kind of soliciting because this mm -hmm. is very, very recently added. So you may find some things with the subtree splits that still need. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of uh, composer, uh, like the project name doesn't match the dependency names in a couple of spots. There's a couple of things misnamed, but it's 
really trivial patches to fix it for. Yeah. And um, the kind of road to Composer was pretty long, so there's a number of different people to, to thank. Um, so, um, yeah, um, these are the folks who've helped us out just from the, from the very beginning of, of creating Composer support and also more recently with the subtree, subtree splits. So. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, I've been thinking about that a little bit because the way that we package and ship Drupal, Drupal core right now, which I call Drupal Drupal, um, is a little bit a little bit wonky compared to like how it should be packaged and shipped. Like we ship with a lock file, and that introduces problems later on when people want to upgrade their site. And so some of the things I've been thinking about is we need to kind of like restructure and re um, repath everything in, in, in the way that the core repository is set up so that when you do a composer install, it can go and get all the scaffolding files and place them in the right place and build your web route for you. And if we have something like that, then we can have dependencies on these core modules. But one of the things that is not real clear how we, how we have it split up is right now we have slash core and all the modules are already underneath there. And so if you're including that, then you just get everything. And so those would have to be moved somewhere that wouldn't be under slash core or slash core itself would have something different. Um, so um, it's almost like we need to break core off of the rest of it so that we have that as a separate thing to do that. But yeah, that, that is a possibility. We can you know, Lego break the whole thing together. Cool. All right. Um, oh, so the other thing I wanted to talk about briefly was the developer tools evaluation that you've heard um, kind of going on in the background if you were at the public board meeting or maybe just at conversations around sprints uh, or in the blog posts, the first one coming out last October, another one in March, and there'll be another one coming soon. Um, basically, we've been asked to look at, um, in, in concert with the Technical Advisory Committee, which is Moshe Weizmann, Angie Byron, and Steve Francia, to look at ways to, quote, modernize the developer tools of Drupal.org. And in many ways, that means um, you know, the notion of a polar merge request. It means using um, standardized workflows that will be more familiar to Drupal outsiders, perhaps. It could mean any number of things. Um, so we're still very much in a kind of exploratory, explore and evaluate um, uh, situation. But um, this is sort of a rough uh, kind of outline of, of how we're proceeding through this process. Um, so we've done some initial evaluation. Um, Angie came out to Portland and did sort of a deep dive with us, with us on staff to um, just like hammer through tools and lists of features and do gap analysis and do the kind of philosophical gap analysis um, in terms of you know how, what's our what's our decision tree look like? Do we do we do we choose a more accessible tool when we lose a more flexible tool? For the purpose of reaching a wider audience, or, you know, what do we prioritize? And thinking, thinking some of those things through. And not all of those questions are answered. Um, so, in the last blog post, we communicated kind of a short list of the sets of tools that we're looking at. I'll talk about that in a moment. And we're moving to what will hopefully be the next step, which will be uh, kind of a prototype or pilot um, of one of the tooling options, probably with a single project to start, depending on how it goes, maybe opening to a few others to evaluate. And the goal is. To Tooling is so big, it's such an important and fundamental part of the Drupal workflow that we want people to actually get like up to their elbows in the new tool and like really use it so that they can actually tell us what's wrong with it. What, what are the gaps? What are the things that need to be fixed? And what's awesome about it? What do they like? What do they want to continue using? So the main options, as you've seen from the blog post, the render evaluation, GitHub, GitLab, and the issue workspaces proposal for Drupal.org, and some notion of kind of you know, the hybrid between, um, you know, there's things that we established that we know would always stay and always will on Drupal.org. Um, project pages are not going anywhere. Uh, Drupal.org is the home of those projects. Um, releases are going to be on Drupal.org. There's many things that are tied into it that are tied into credit and security 
process and all sorts of things that we want to preserve. Um, so there's some things we know. So we have to find ways to do certain kinds of integrations when we're doing this kind of analysis and this kind of pilot. Um, so again, some of this stuff is preliminary. There's a, um, there should be a, another blog post um, with a little bit more detail. We've had some meetings here at the con and I've talked to people in sprint rooms and just had some one-off conversations. Um, but hopefully there'll be another blog post talking a little bit more about this um, uh, in maybe two, three weeks after the con um, about what we're thinking. But yeah, as I said, the next step is just to learn by actually trying to do it and not just trying to hold the whole problem space in our head um, all, all at one time. Um, so prototype level integration, pilot with a single project, do a round of feedback and gap analysis, see if we hit a brick wall, maybe pilot something else, or maybe start expanding that and thinking about it. Um, so, um, talking about just the whole uh, wealth of contribution journey related work that we've been doing and what might come next. Uh, related to Drupal CI, although it's not necessarily just about Drupal CI, there's this notion of, of doing branch labels so that, uh, as you may know, we mass update core issues with the, ver the new version number that everyone's developing against basically every six months. And it'd be great to use standard labels that say like current devel <laughs> and current stable um, just to make things a little bit more clean and that would also make it easier in the test matrix uh, to be testing against what you know is the current current level of core. Um, I, did, I misspelled reimagining, um, re-imaging. Um, with Composer, there's an opportunity to look at how distributions work in a different way. Um, there's a kind of a significant opportunity. Um, there's a lot of frustrating and kind of hacky workaround stuff that goes on with uh, building and maintaining a distribution. And so, you know, there's a question of does distribution become more or less a composed JSON um, with a little bit of sort of structure around it? Or what could that be? It's something that should be looked into now that um, that's kind of a core part of workflow. Um, another thing that um, we haven't had time to talk about in much detail is um, there's some documentation for the uh, JavaScript API for Drupal that's currently hosted by a community member. It'd be great to bring that into API at Drupal level. Um, so those are just a few things that, that may come up as we do some of our forward planning. Um, any questions about this kind of stuff? Um, all right. Keep going a little bit. Talk about the infrastructure. It makes the whole thing run. This is my favorite GIF. And we've seen it before. Um, the, the great Pachinko machine. Um, there are, there's not like a huge amount to, to talk about in terms of strict detail. Michael might speak to a little bit of this, or I don't know, um, perhaps Neil. Um, but, you know, we standardized on our virtualized infrastructure. Um, most of the uh, instances of our pre production and production environments are actually now VMs running on our bare metal hardware. Um, we updated our uh, config management, our, our Puppet and Hira tree, um, and something that is a little bit more outward facing, there's now HTTP2 support um, uh, on our infrastructure. So, um, does anyone have infrastructure specific questions? Yes. Uh, we're migrating over to Datadog for uh, uh, alerting. Alerts, yeah. Uh, migrated, completed the migration mostly Yep, for our previous provider, our paging um, system. We uh, yeah. Uh, we now have separate Jenkins instances for dev stage and prod environments. Yep. Um, instead of one massive Jenkins instance with thousands of jobs in it. Um. Yeah, it's mostly just keeping doing things to make to make the work a little smoother. So. Um. Let's see here. So here's the last topic that is. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, right now we're at the uh, uh, open source lab for Oregon State University, is where uh, just about everything is, um, except for the Drupal CI test bots, because those are spun up in AWS. Um, you may have heard in the uh, public board meeting we're currently doing an RFP process, looking for other sort of managed infrastructure partners. Uh, we're in the middle of that process, though, so there's no decisions or, or news on that yet. So. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, it's not free. Oh, yeah. No, no, it's not free. Well, some of our, as I went 
uh, I'd have to go back a lot of slides. Some of our technology supporters that you saw on some of the earlier slides, some of those will discount our comp services for the association, but there's a lot of stuff that we simply have to pay for. For example, the um, Drupal CI test bots, um, that runs in the region of four grand a month to provide testing for the project. Um, every once in a while, we get a small grant from uh, Amazon, but uh, they don't. They don't have a nonprofit program to comp that kind of service yet. So that's that's part of what memberships, of what supporting partnerships, of what programs like the industry pages and their, you know, they have sponsorships. We're all engineers. We don't normally think about the kind of sponsorship space as being important, but it helps us helps us fund the testing. It helps us fund the bots. So. Significantly cheaper. Yeah. yeah. So, open source, uh, they give us bandwidth or that? Uh, some bandwidth, mail transport. <laughs> mail transport's a big one. They, they give us some elements of this. Yeah. Yeah, you want to come on? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the open source slide is or has been for a long time. Yeah, their their model is evolving, um, but yeah, that's kind of the, the basic. Yes. Um, back to the, uh, the previous topic of um, the dev tooling. Sure. One of the last things that Josh had done was his analysis with other people mm -hmm. on how the effort would be to migrate to GitHub as an example. Yes. And mm -hmm. he estimated it would be you know, one thousand million dollars from the developer. Mm -hmm. So presuming community is not just going to roll out there, but we want some five million to do a migration. Um, what do you, if, consumer, if a right. non Drupal, non custom made solution is determined that the best path forward, mm -hmm. how is the funding of the, what be another mass migration of mm -hmm. infrastructure? That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> as an engineer, I'm a little bit less prepared to than are some of our kind of strategic partnership folks um, at the association. But it is so that is part of the point is um, whatever option we select there will have to be sustainable. We only have so much budget um, and we have to make it work. So it's part of the evaluation process has, has a lot to do with whether these potential open source tooling partners uh, are willing to give as well and contribute themselves to making that possible. Um, that's going to be something that can close some of that gap. Um, it's, there's also a little bit of a question of scope, right? Because we talked a little bit about, um, you know, when we, if we pilot an integration, having a single project play over there, we'll be able to understand a little bit further the scope of how much, how, how significant a level of integration we're maintaining and like how complex that's going to be. Um, right, there's a there's a spectrum of what that could look like um, and what it could take to to implement that. So, um, yeah, please. And then one one of the thing that we you know have to also take into account is like how much it would cost to take our current um, infrastructure that we have now, our custom built one, and upgrade it to Drupal eight. Right. So eventually, that is something that we're going to want to do on Drupal.org, and so there's a large development cost there too. So we're looking at a development cost down the road, one way or the other. And so it's really the delta between the two that we have to concern ourselves with. Like it's significantly more expensive for. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. One other question. This kind of like the topic we work that we work on, right? Um, a minor issue that comes up occasionally is uh, the yield problem of mice well not having the all the Ah. Uh, so <laughs> is there any intention to add support to the yield generation mm -hmm. support? No. Yeah, we've been doing the precursors to that in the, uh, I can't remember the exact situation, but in the, 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 the 
larger weeds. Uh, so that's all set up. Uh, yeah, now it's a matter of uh, you know, yeah, downtime for an hour or more. Well, figuring out how long the downtime might be. <laughs> a long time. Yeah, or uh, figuring out how to do trips, but uh, but you're not being primary and secondary servers. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, that's, I mean, it's totally on the list. Um, it's, for, for us, it's kind of been a balance of prioritization and sprinting towards the con, but it's, it's getting very close. It's much closer than it's been uh, in a long time, so. The new Drupal bot supports it now. Oh, sure. uh, yeah, the new IRC bot has, will not die when there's a, uh, when there's an emoji. Um, That's a big question. Um, so it, it kind of depends on what area of contribution you're sort of talking about. But in the most general terms, um, we have the Drupal.org customizations queue. There's kind of a variety of issues in there and things that might be fixed. You can contribute patches back to that the way that you can contribute patches to any other issue queue. And we also pr produce development environments, remotely hosted development environments that we can give to people who want to contribute that have a sanitized uh, instance of Drupal.org so that you can develop against that to roll your patches and contribute them back. But can I create my on my host network? Um, we've had some folks who have, who have hacked that the today. The database is massive. We, we strongly advise not to do that. We give you a, uh, an environment to connect to bug and everything you need to connect to it and, and run things. You really want to try to run it locally, you could, but it's, but then you end up with issues of moving it back to production and things are not the same. What about the code locally? You can code remotely, you can edit files locally and, you know, push them off to the remote server, you can, uh, yeah. Yeah, if you can speak SSH, uh, run uses PHP form, yes. so yeah. Right. To, uh, yeah. And we just installed TextMate for somebody, there was a, 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 like a TextMate window where you're editing on TextMate locally and it just changes it on the server. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it takes us, the discussion takes about half an hour to set up a new website. Uh, it is a, you should trim off uh, some of the old data, uh, like uh, issues and days. Uh, you want to keep like, good practice stuff and then find all the extreme edge cases. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it comes out to about uh, like at least 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, don't, don't we have like a contributor? Yeah, yeah. 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 Checklist. yeah. 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 yeah we'll be at the sprints. So. Um, but we're not taking on Drupal 8 yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so last topic um, that I wanted to uh, raise based on some kind of stand up conversations that were happening here is about the governance of Drupal.org. Um, and as a community, we're talking about the governance of Drupal the project in general. Um, and um, I just think it's an interesting topic and one worth exploring. It's one way I don't, I'm not proposing answers to all the concerns that currently exist around it. I'm just, I'd like to sort of surface some of the questions. Um, so let's first of all talk about what's in scope for the Drupal Association engineering team, what our mission is and what, how that translates into our mandate. Um, so you've probably heard the refrain over and over, but the mission of the Drupal Association is to unite the global open source community to build and promote Drupal. Um, but what work is implicitly mandated by that for the engineering team? Um, so that includes providing the canonical source for the software, providing the home for a community that's globally accessible, uh, providing tools that let the community continue to develop Drupal, um, promoting Drupal to developer evaluators, promoting Drupal to user evaluators, um, fostering that ecosystem of service providers in ways like through the marketplace rankings and through hosting case studies and things like that at the industry phase initiative. Um, and also supporting the fiscal welfare of the association itself um, with whatever kind of future development we need to do that uh, in order to simply fund the rest of that work um, and make that available. Um, so these are at least, um, it's probably not a complete list, but in my mind, these are the implicit mandates for the association engineering team that come out of our mission. Um, and um, from there, you can sort of ask, well, what, what are the ways that we can fulfill those mandates? And what are, 
um, what's, what, how do we tread the like, kind of level of authority? So, um, uh, yeah, so managing the scaffolding of the project is relatively uh, obvious, right? We run Drupal.org, we maintain the collaboration space, the tool set, um, we make sure security updates get deployed on Drupal.org, we um, uh, run the testing infrastructure. Um, we also focus on trying to clear blockers that just empower their, com their community to solve certain issues on their own. Um, that comes into play. I mean, a lot of conversations with uh, Core, for example, about how they should be managing Composer within Core uh, relate to work that we do providing their Composer facades. There's overlap in some of the mandate in cases like that. Um, it can also mean taking on work ourselves that when the nature of that work means it's easier for a dedicated team or it's something that's not a great use of volunteer time, right? We don't want the people who are here to contribute to the project to spend all their day, you know, fighting spam <laughs> because it's, it too much gets through. <laughs> um, and then uh, the last one is the complicated one. And this is where I think the difficult questions about community governance come in because there are um, intersectional problem spaces where our mission to support and promote the project actually intersects with the software itself. Um, and so where does our authority play um, in that space? And again, the composer facade is one such example. The way that we implement the composer facade that everybody uses uh, now for building Drupal 8 sites is a direct product impact and it requires um, you know, changes to the repo URLs that are shipped with core and all that kind of stuff. So, um, it's an interesting question. And the last point is this, this notion of these intersectional problem spaces and managing where our authority lies is a difficult one because the page on Drupal.org that has our mission statement has a bold sentence at the bottom, a very strongly worded sentence that says, the Drupal Association has no authority over the planning, functionality, and development of the Drupal software. Um, because there's a well-intentioned um, and important firewall between we're, we, you know, we don't manage Drupal the project, which we, we, we manage the ability for people to contribute and to, you know, we provide that, that home for these activities to happen. But unfortunately, you know, the very nature of providing that scaffolding has an impact um, on product decisions, um, whether it's in the changes that happen to the project application process, how we provide security signals, the, the, up, the way the updates are provided and managed, uh, the, the composer facade, all of these things are fundamentally linked to the software. So right now, when the community is in the space that we're thinking about governance, um, you know, these are questions that become important. Um, and they're just things that we're thinking about and reflecting on, on not things that I'm up here proposing any kind of fundamental answers about how we address those. Um, but I did wanna talk about kind of oversight of our work um, what kind of bodies exist and what we're responsible to on a sort of official and legal level and, and a, in a more general case. So I um, kind of wrote my own sort of mini uh, mission statement, which is that we work in service of the community at the direction of our executive director and our board. Um, and um, so our direction, our direction comes from the ED, our direction comes from the board, but um, you know, large prior, larger prioritization decisions but everything that we do is intended to be in service to the community and into the, um, of the needs of the community that they've surfaced to us. Um, so um, how do we try and provide visibility into the work and decisions? We're trying to do our work in public issue queues as much as possible. The change notifications that you're probably subscribed to that we do at the beginning of each two week sprint, we usually change it from weekly to two week to match our sprint process. The blog posts that we put out, um, and as much as possible, we try and work with volunteers and the subject matter experts that are within the community, um, pulling in people like Michael, um, pulling in others. Um, there's a whole group of folks who are part of the, uh, what were the Drupal.org working groups and what's now, those members are part of a body called the Drupal.org advisory uh, body. So um, many of the people that like we approach when we have these questions kind of came out of that body. But it's just, oftentimes it's, you know, the person in core who knows things about this. And, you know, we try and find uh, those people who are experts in these areas, so. Um, yeah, so like I said, I'm not presenting uh, this, comp this uh, uh, section on governance to propose um, a specific delineation of responsibilities or an answer about where the authority of the association lies over the project or the tooling 
for the like where those lines blur, but I just simply like to surface how they overlap each other. Um, and yeah, with that, I'd like to go to any additional Q and A. Um, if there's other questions about what we've just talked about or any other topics, um, we'd be happy to field them. Before we get into questions, uh, I have a question for you. Thank you. So in my, I was in the Innovation Center for Unborn Tech, and mm -hmm. one of the key issues that came up kept coming up was around uh, internationalization. Hmm, okay. Um, Drupal.org. Itself. .org itself, yep. And all of the tools that we need. Mm -hmm. um, the example on Monday was of somebody in a country in Africa where the dominant language Mm -hmm. And so when he's trying to encourage people to get involved and to learn Drupal, the first step is the first thing to overcome is like the tool, the language. Yep. Even things like the Drupal ladder is uh, in English. Right. And that's the kind of thing. So has any consideration been given at um, a more official level of making the content and tools available? That's a really big question. It's an interesting question. Um, user guide? Uh, the, well, yeah, the Drupal 8 user guide, for example, is, um, which is, you know, it gets imported into the new documentation guides and the new documentation pages, is localized into a number of languages. And in some ways, that's a precursor to potentially allowing the rest of documentation to be localized, um, which would be, I think, a good step. One of the concerns in a sort of general way is moderating content um, because Again, we are a very small staff, and even among the volunteers, finding the ability to moderate in a variety of languages might be difficult. Um, and, um, you know, if you have the documentation about the best way, best practices for using, I don't know, best practices for using tokens in Drupal 8 or something like that, and that's in English and something changes, the English page gets updated and the Spanish page gets updated and then maybe there's a number of other localized pages that fall out of date and fall further behind. So you have a little bit of a forking of information problem. That said, as that slide said before, we're, our mission is to unite a global community. It's not to focus just on the people who speak English. So it's a tough, it's a tough problem to solve. Um, yeah. Yeah, they have a right. Exactly. If you look at localized Wikipedia articles, um, the same topic you know, have a very, very different um, presentation and discussion in different languages. So, yeah, we have the technical. We have to avoid local organization. Yeah, organizing people to support it. So yeah, that, I mean, I think it's a really important topic um, and um, it's something where, it, again, yeah, from a technical point of view, we can do it. We might need a, a kind of a community body that could help. It's, it's all the, that kind of moderation work that's gonna be the, the harder part of that problem. Um, yeah. We kind of hope just Google solves it for us with really good Google <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we can wait for the AI, but no. Um, any other questions? Yes. Are there any discussions happening uh, going on uh, about improvements in the UI and UX and Drupal art? Um, for instance, uh, the user profile page or features from Red Curve, mm. uh, from Station, uh, of Ludwig, Edgar, or, or like Gary? Yeah, like actually, each of those examples has some discussions going on in particular. So. Or, or some issues. Go ahead, Neil. Drupal.org yeah. Drupal forward slash project forward slash Drupal.org, all one word. And then just click on the all issues link and they're all in there. Yeah, and those, to speak to those particular ones, um, uh, 
Uh, you mentioned Dredger, for example. Mark Carver is here right now working on, um, he's doing work to try and port Dredger features as things that you are just exist on Drupal.org and that you can um, enable as individual boxes like via your account rather than using it as a separate extension. Yeah, it's something he's working on here. He's looking for people who might help sprint on that. Um, um, he's been working on it for a little while as he's had time available. Um, um, we've had internal conversations about user profiles just because we want to do another pass on those as well. And we'd certainly welcome um, some yeah. thoughts. It's on a page in the right spot that has marks and white space for all of the place. Yeah, we need so, to kind of clean that up. Um, yeah, there's, and you there's a lot of things that are in progress. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot. And unfortunately, you can see that you can see the team. So we're sort of triaging and trying to go through at a time. But it, it, you know, if you, want, if you want us to roll up a dev site and you want to kind of help clean up some user profiles, that could be very helpful. We will likely be, normally on Fridays, the infrastructure team, the Drupal and Org team, the security team all sit at one table. If you can find that table to be close to it, put an app table. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or he will be. Yeah, yeah he'll have that hat. I'll have that hat and you'll probably not have that hat. And cool. everybody from the security team shows up will have that hat. Well, any other questions? Oh, yeah. We actually are using most of this time. It's good. For the next few years? Sure, I hope so. In the next few years. <laughs> that's I want to do it. That's well, a, it's on my list of something yeah. to look at in the next year. Yeah, I don't think it, it I don't think it has been explicitly written into our page, but I don't think I've updated our roadmap page uh, quite recently. I, I think it would be great and really actually important in the context of that site builder tool that we were talking about earlier. So Uh, I don't think it checks them. <laughs> it's not doing the checking for you, but that that actually could be mitigated pretty easily with a composer script or a composer plugin and with package signing information in the extras field, and it would check for you. So you've been working track of that in certain problems. No. Yeah, sell back. Yeah. It's something we could get done, but we have a good plan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. There's there's still just a lot of ideas that SHA hashes are useful when they're not. <laughs> uh, seeing as this is being recorded, can you please give us an update on the progress to uh, HTTPS all the things? Um, That's I think it's done. Minus update status as a redirect to place because of core issues. But yeah, but I think yeah, it's more on the. Yeah, Drupal Core still has that issue open that really makes you compete. So if you're looking to spray on something tomorrow, <laughs> I can get you the ID of that issue. And if some help would be appreciated, everything other than everything is HTTP. Yeah, everything else. Dev sites, everything. Well, except for uh, CDN, which you should be depending on your patches anyway. Yeah. Um, yes, OK. So I will. Echo, uh, and thank you for inviting me on the working committee. And you had one slide up there talking about the change in uh, marketing mm -hmm. agents. And I guess I was just curious about the issue credit targeting up mm -hmm. the uh, subject. And uh, at, this, at this point, is, is that really the only place where you're using the issue credit agent up on the sites? And I guess on what sites it is, or is that? We're, we're also surfacing it on the profiles for organizations. Um, so it, when you're so when you go to look at any organization's profile, whether they're a service provider or they're a community organization, it's there. Um, I don't think we're using that kind of programmatic. Oh well, we're, yeah, we're using that information for the um, for the industry page uh, partner selection. Um, that was based on credits and and whether they worked in the relevant industry. Uh, but those are the main places we're doing it right now. Sure. And then just out of curiosity, is there any discussion of uh, 
board and project that we come back to the site of that issue. But there are any other discussions about um, how that process works or uh, changes to that in terms of uh, how that might work? Just related to the issue, you mentioned something about maybe uh, measuring uh, commits that didn't have. Yeah, there's a few there's a few open issues that are about there's one that's specifically about just I think it's kind of a generic plan issue for the ranking algorithm um, that just has a few things captured in it. And then there's a couple issues floating around for things like capturing the for commits rather than just for the credited in the UI um, credits. But um, yeah, they're, they're floating around in a few places. It's not necessarily totally well organized, but you, you can certainly pick them up. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just make this comment in case, in case this is reported, and Tim and I have to talk about this later. But sure. I just wanted to bring up the issue of governance because yeah. it seems like we had sort of um, uneasy evolution from a lot of uh, working groups that were having a put on what was happening on the board org, and now there's just one working group with what, three people sure. and advisory committees and things not really acting. Um, and it seems sort of problematic to me that, you know, Nothing else, there's not a sufficient diversity of, of interest and experience levels and uh, people evaluating what really the priority is. And mm -hmm. I don't, this is sort of not your responsibility to <laughs> have these systems in place, but sure, I think yeah. the impact in the work you guys do by not having a, a strong sort of community governance project that's helping you guys decide uh, what the right priority is, the right strategy is. Yeah. I uh, was just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Is that something? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. Um, I, I, when I talked to, when I spoke to governments a little bit earlier, um, like as I said, there's those, there's those particular places where our decision making as it respects to the tooling and as it res as respect to the tooling and with respect to the um, kind of the scaffolding of the project have significant impacts on the project itself and on how people work. Um, I don't necessarily know the right channel to raise that Concern. It's it's good to raise it with us because I can talk to you know uh, the board and I can talk to Megan and talk about that a little bit. I think it's good to raise it within the context of the larger project governance discussion that's going on right now. Um, I think it's it's certainly relevant to that. Um, yeah, I mean we'll, we'll we'll need to think about next steps. We'll need to think about what'll work. What's interesting about the working groups um, is the working groups. Um, I had to go back and dig dig through some history, but you know. They weren't originally formed strictly as a governing body so much as literally working groups with the notion that they would be taking on some of these tasks and doing some of these things and it kind of uh, that changed over time to be more kind of a discussion group or a vetting group and or, or an oversight uh, idea in some cases and the different groups happened in different ways and kind of um, uh, you know it just evolved in a different direction so I don't know what the right model is. Um, you know that one seems like it didn't sustain but there probably is one and and you know this notion of i've been asking myself about the larger governance question is how do we know who speaks with authority of a diverse community right it, just in general not just for drupal.org or for the project at large notion of kind of community elected positions is that is one way of knowing that there's some authority behind a voice so maybe that's a, a thing to explore but um yeah i'm still looking for the right idea for sure Which is a hard way to make decisions sometimes. Yeah. 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 
I've come up with the right kind of formal structure, but it's one of us that is what we're not here. Yeah, that's certainly true. Yeah. But at the same time, open to figuring out ways to improve that because there's we've seen places where it's fallen down. We've seen we've also seen places where it's been very successful, but it's just hard to it's hard to figure out how to cover every case. So yeah. Okay. Any questions? Comments? Concerns? All right. Thank you very much for attending. Um, during the sprints, we've talked about a lot of things that you can sprint on. So here's your printer information here as well. And uh, you can let us know what you think about the con and find this information about the session. And hopefully, um, I will get a recording up and all that kind of stuff very soon. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. I'd like to meet you tomorrow, Rex, so I can learn how to. What? Uh